Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. And thanks for joining me today. And I want to say thank you to the organizers for making this wonderful event possible every week. I feel honored to be part of it. So uh, today I want to share with you this recently published work, which was done actually during my PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Let's start off by uh, looking at how we get the particles moving. We have these three micron silica particles. We coat them with metal on one hemisphere so that um, the two hemispheres have di di distinct polarizabilities. We suspend these particles in water, sandwich them between two transparent ITO coated cover slips that are also uh, conductive, so we can apply electric field across the sample. As we apply electric field, there will be three consequences. First, the particles will stand up with their interface aligning with the, uh, with the, with the field direction because they want to maximize their induced dipole moment. It is, a, it is a quasi 2D system. So when we observe with a microscope from the top or the bottom, the particles always appear to be uh, like half black, half white, so that we can track their orientations easily. These asymmetric induced uh, charges build up at the uh, surface of the, of the particles and counter ions from the solution come to screen them and bring asymmetric fluid flow to drive their motion toward one hemisphere. The asymmetric chain charge distributions on one hand gave rise to the asymmetric fluid flow to drive the particles motion. And on the other hand, they, all, they can also be approximated as two off-centered dipoles for particles to communicate with each other. The best part of the system is the controllability of the particle motion and the interactions brought by the alternating electric field. Here on the left, I'm showing the change of speed and direction of the motion with increasing frequency of the AC electric field. And on the right, I'm showing the induced dipole coefficient dependence on frequency. The pink curves here um, is the imaginary and real part of, of the metal hemisphere. And we can see the dramatic change in sign and magnitude as we increase the frequency. And on the other hand, we can see uh, the dielectric hemisphere doesn't really change much. Because of the geometry confinement in 2D, the, 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 the dipoles can only be uh, aligned or anti-aligned, which correspond to repulsion and attraction respectively. As ions in the solution play so important a role, by changing the ionic strength of the solution, we can also tune the critical frequencies for the motion and interactions. I'll show you next why we care about switching the direction of the motion. We love this system for the flexibility brought by the uh, tunable uh, um, interactions between particles, but we have to admit the limitations as well. One, everything is in 2D, and two, as we change the frequency, both speed and interactions would change. So in other words, they cannot be tuned uh, purely independently. Actually, for all active particles, because, because of their um, persistent self propulsion, which distinguishes them from their passive counterparts, the directionality is a very important factor to determine their collective behavior. In this regard, our genus particles have a unique advantage as the induced dipoles have, uh, they're off-centered. So when particles come close and interact with each other, they can exert torques and experience torques from each other to change the direction of their motion to give us a very rich com uh, and complex collective behavior due to the, uh, due to their orientational interactions. 
the study of active matter can uh, has been popular in the past decade. I think it's fair to say that the whole field started with this piece of theoretical work published in 1995, in which the authors proposed a simple model to mimic the collective motion of birds. In this model, each particle has its own velocity, and at each time step, they will find their neighbors within a certain range and take their average orientation as their next as their own orientation for the next time step. This is a model that cannot be simpler, or maybe it can, <laughs> but uh, it does a good job reproducing collective behavior similar to that of uh, bird flocks. As theoreticians proposing the model, they don't need to worry about how the model can be realized. And this is where we experimentalists step in. In our genus particles, because the two hemispheres are asymmetric, we can adjust the parameters so that they carry a strong dipole in the head. With this picture in mind, when two particles approach each other, they will feel the strong repulsion and um, the torques will make them align transiently. When the concentrations is high enough, like here, particles in a certain range can take the same orientation and move together like a bird flock. Now we know that asymmetric interactions are key to different collective dynamics. We should expect dramatic changes in collective behavior when we tune the interaction rules between particles. Indeed, when we change the particle moving directions so that the strong dipole is now in the tail instead of the head, we can see particles don't mind getting closer to each other. And as time goes by, the system undergoes something like a gas liquid phase separation. The unique non-equilibrium features make the system look like gas liquid, like gas condensation globally. But locally, if we look at a single cluster, it looks like the water is boiling, AKA evaporating. So we collaborated with theoreticians and confirmed that this clustering behavior can be driven mainly by torques, which uh, provides a new mechanism to design and understand the behavior of non-equilibrium systems. If we look at the coarsening dynamics of this particular system, it follows a classic power law, the classic phase separation power, uh, coarsening power law of one third, same as the traditional phase separation driven by um, free energy, in spite of the very different mechanisms. Now we want to take advantage of the fact that we can resolve individual particles in the system. Here I'm showing our uh, clust one cluster uh, that is stirring or like churning of the particles, by the particles, and for the particles constantly. I'm coloring the particles according to their positions in the first frame or time zero, blue to red from center to periphery. Uh, yes, from center to periphery. <laughs> when we play the video, we can, we can notice that the particles are in general stay in distance and the travel in coordination. Although the cluster as a whole remain almost unchanged, but the members are no longer the same batch. As we plot the remaining uh, particles in the cluster with time, we can see it's perfectly exponential, which means the particles going across, the particles across the whole cluster have similar chance to leave, not just the particles at the interface. Actually, once I met Professor Michael Case in a conference, and he commented that this cluster is the giant interface by itself. We went on further to characterize the particle speed and rotational frequency according to their local area fractions. We can see that particles in the gas phase are moving faster than those um, in, the, in, in, the, in the cluster. But across different area fraction in the cluster, um, within the cluster, the particle speed doesn't really change much. In contrast, 
the rotational frequency characterized by this effective uh, rotational uh, diffusion constant, it increases monotonically with increasing local uh, area fraction. We have noticed before that the particles seem to travel in coordination within the cluster. So here I am showing the angular correlation between neighboring particles in the cluster. The movie is slowed down five times, so we can see what's really happening. I'm coloring here the relative orientation of neighboring particles. Red is aligned, blue is anti-aligned, and the color in between is the orientation in between. We see these red chains form and break every uh, like very frequently, corresponding to the transient chains uh, formed by uh, particles following each other and moving in coordination. We can quantify the structure uh, within the cluster by calculating a 2D uh, radio distribution function or GeoVar, which characterizes the chance of finding another particle relative to the reference particle in the center. We see that uh, more particles are located along the, uh, their orientations compared with sideways. And there are always more particles in the front than in the back as a result of the blocked motion within a crowded cluster. Furthermore, we calculated the angular uh, correlation function, which is basically averaging the colored vectors here, and uh, uh, found the particles behind, behind a reference particle is actually more aligned than uh, particles ahead of the reference particle. This is reasonable because the followers are usually more faithful as they follow because of the weak uh, head to tail attraction between the particles, whereas the particles ahead of motion may be obstacles of any orientation. For a single genus particle, the direction of motion is determined by its orientation, like its geometry, its orientation in terms of geometry. However, within a cluster or when particle uh, interparticle interactions are significant, this may, may not be the case. As we have seen earlier, in denser regions, particles rotate more frequently. As a result of the torques exerted by neighboring particles, this also leads to the collective discrepancy of the velocity direction and the orientation of the particles within the cluster. Here we define theta n, which is the angle between its or ge geometry orientation versus the vector pointing from the particle to the cluster center, and theta v, which is the angle between the velocity uh, vector to this vector pointing toward the center. Oh, I forgot is this vector pointing toward the center or toward the particle, but that doesn't, uh, I think it's toward the cluster center. It doesn't have the arrow here, which is weird. Uh, okay. <laughs> so from the histogram here, we see uh, theta n picked as zero, which means particles overall point inward, stabilizing the cluster. However, the actual velocity direction, which is the pink histogram here, is more randomly distributed, consistent with the fact that um, the cluster remains in the steady state. Actually, before phase separation, we can see the discrepancy between theta n and theta v is absent. And this discrepancy only arises after uh, clusters form. Knowing that the um, collective orientation points toward the center of a cluster, we started to characterize the polarity field of the clusters. And collaborated with theoreticians to establish the relationship between density gradient and polarity field. 
and, um, and polarity. So here we can see uh, where the area of fraction drops uh, most steeply, which correspond to a highest um, uh, density gradient. It also corresponds to the highest polarity uh, magnitude. Starting from interparticle forces and torques, we arrived at a continuum theory to predict, to predict the phase separation as a result of the density gradient and polarity coupling. So you may say, well, uh, people have shown that active particles can face separated, can face separated with only excluded volume repulsion due to uh, particles slowing down with increasing density, as Professor Michael Case and many others have studied extensively. So we show here that the slowing, the slowdown mechanism would not result in phase separation with the parameters in our system because uh, it requires much higher uh, speed and uh, area fraction. Uh, okay, I don't know why it's above one, it's not physical. <laughs> Maybe it's just uh, with our uh, a strong repulsion between the particles, the slowdown mechanism is not, uh, is not physical, not uh, realistic. And if we ignore the uh, slides still slowing down from, from gas to clusters and only consider the torques, we, we get a, a phase diagram that is closer to our experimental system, but still not quite. Only when we combine the torque mechanism and the experimentally observed slowing down uh, from the gas to the cluster phase, we can, we can uh, have a more reasonable phase diagram. And most surprisingly and productively is that this phase diagram predicts a regime of high area fraction uh, with uniform phase which we didn't, uh, uh, which I didn't pay attention to experimentally, and we didn't expect it without doing this uh, calculation. So I went back to the experiments and found indeed find a, a high density uniform phase. At area fraction of 0.35, we see again a uniform phase without phase separation. There are transient chains still and quality coordinated motion everywhere in this system, uh, similar to the clusters, which we have seen before, but there's no phase separation. Or maybe we can, we can, we can regard this as a like giant whole cluster uh, of the system compared to the cluster we had before because their uh, internal dynamics is very similar. But anyways, this is, uh, uh, this is a very good example of, of, of the predicting power of the theory we had. And also uh, gain, uh, help us to gain confidence in, the, in our uh, comparison between the experiments and our theory. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and take any questions you may have. I didn't time it well, so it's a bit short, but I believe shorter is always better, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Zhangjie. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Now we are moving on to the uh, Q&A session, and uh, if the audience has uh, questions, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask us a question. Or you can type your question into the chat box. Hello, can you Hi. And Dr. Sanji, uh, I have a question about your phase separation. Um, yes. So what's, uh, uh, if we have a gems particle with talk, it's always have the phase separation or we should have a special uh, interaction case? Uh, Yes, so the interaction is a key. 
like genus particles themselves, they can be attractive, they can be repulsive, they can do all kinds of things. So phase separation is only observed when a certain criteria is met. Uh, so what, what, what kind of criteria? I mean, if we so, have two particles, they have a friction, for example, um, they, they will cause the torque effect. Uh, can they have such uh, phase separation behaviors? So, uh, like I, what I said here, for example, like uh, from the flocking behavior to this phase separation behavior, we simply yeah. switched their direction of motion. So, for example, this with this strong dipole in the head, they will not be able to come close. Whenever mm -hmm. they want to come closer, they will feel strong repulsion and get separated. But when they have the uh, when, when they have the strong dipole at the tail, or maybe they don't have the strong dipole at all, they, they don't mind getting closer to each other and um, like phase separation is possible, but it's not so guaranteed. Tail, talk on the tail is the king point for the phase separation? Uh, because like how we have two dipoles on one particle, right? So the mm -hmm. relative magnitude of these two dipoles determine how two particles would interact when they meet each other, right? Okay, yeah. So uh, what I'm saying is the interparticle interactions determined how the particles would interact when they come close to each other, which determines further determine their collective behavior. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Dr. Zhang. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hi, this, uh, this is Kai. Very nice talk. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm following last question actually. I don't fully understand how your mechanism caused this such such a like phase separation and like the diverse phase diagram because you really just the MIPS, but here you say you play, you shoot the laser at different points of the particles, then generate different dipoles and then cause uh, different clusters. Is that kind of mechanism like this? Uh, what I'm saying here is that uh... So you know MIPS. So MIPS is usually considered as uh, 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 the phase separation resulted from resulting from the slowing down of particles, right? Yeah, exactly. But here, but here, because our particles actually have strong repulsion, so if we uh, uh, use MIPS to to do the calculation, you can see the results is no longer physical. So which ruled out that. Right, um, yeah. so uh, like the traditional MIPS, uh, and our uh, calculation shows that. Um, well, I didn't include the. Maybe I did. No, I didn't. Uh, okay, so I didn't include the uh, the equations here. But we uh, uh, our theory starting from the interaction and uh, the, the forces and torques between two particles and expand it to uh, a hydrodynamic equation to show the, uh, there's, a co there's coupling between the polarity of the dense and the density gradient. Actually, uh, I would, I guess I, I, what I can say, what I, maybe I can say this is our particles, our particles have the ability to, uh, to have to, I think the polarity between particles first arises, which leads to density gradient and further leads to phase separation. Okay, so what first caused, I know the hydrodynamic interactions cause the kind of repulsions between the particles uh, to stop them getting closer. Um, but compared with the normal uh, genus particles, what's the specialty of your particles? Um, so the special part about these particles is the, uh, 
interactions between them. And in particular, it's a strong dipole in the tail and the opposite smaller dipole in the head. So the tail, the, uh, the strong tail dipole make them possible, makes, makes it possible for them to come closer. And the weak uh, head to tail attraction makes the align, alignment possible. So that in, as a result, they kind of form chains pointing toward the center of the cluster. I see, but how, how do you experimentally realize this? Like a special material or different? Uh, oh, okay. So that is uh, tuned by the uh, uh, frequency of the, of the electric field together uh, with the ionic strength of the solution. Because by tuning the frequency, we can tune the interact the, the induced dipoles of the particles and therefore the interactions between the particles. I see, yeah, I missed the introduction parts. Oh, That's okay. why. <laughs> that makes sense. Thanks a lot. No problem. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize your problem in the beginning. <laughs> no, no, I didn't ask it clearly at the beginning. That's the problem. Thank you. No problem, thank you. Uh, I have another, sorry, someone else uh, Go asked. ahead. Okay, uh, so another question is like, uh, this is a quasi 2D case, right? Um, yes. So if you increase the size of the slit, how will the cluster behavior change? Uh, if we increase what? Okay, so you confine your system in a narrow slit, I guess. Uh-huh. Uh, and then like, if you increase the height, let like, make it okay. to be, to okay. be light. So, uh -huh. uh, so, the particles here are three micron. The spacer is one twenty micron. So yeah. they're they're confined not because of uh of the of the height. They're oh. they're confined because, um, I think because they're 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 heavy. They are twice. Their density is twice of water. I see. Ah, uh, okay. And, we did have uh, we have uh, MD simulations uh, with uh, in three D systems yeah. uh, in 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 the twenty sixteen paper, and uh, the the general behavior does not change. I mean the 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 phase separation and the the, the flocking behavior does not change with the uh, uh, dimensionality. Okay, uh, uh, sorry to follow your question. You did an MD simulation, but in that case, uh, I think you don't have hydrodynamics. Right? I'm right. Actually, in this case, well, when I said hydrodynamic, I said hydrodynamic equations. I didn't mean hydrodynamic interactions as you understand it. So, uh, for like throughout our experiments and, and simulation and theory, we only consider uh, mainly uh, we we actually main only consider the uh, the electric uh, the dipole dipole interactions, so okay. that gives rise to uh, most of our uh, like the dramatic clotted behavior we observed. Okay, so we so didn't consider the a uh, hydrodynamic interaction because the uh, uh, elect uh, the dipole dipole interactions is much stronger than. Um, than the uh, magnitude of the hydrodynamic interactions, possibly. So the results of that simulation match quite well with the experimental results, I guess? Yes. So it reproduces most of the uh, uh, behavior qualitatively. OK, so then hydrodynamics have no rules. Sounds like, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, sorry, another question from Tiger. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So uh, as you mentioned in your face diagram, there's a face called a uniform face. Uh-huh. Um, but if you look at the, the, your movies, like uh, 
you still can observe the chains, even right. though in general they are kind of uniform, but locally the chain oh. forms. Right. I mean, is when we uh, say uniform, we're looking at a larger scale than single particles, right? When we talk about phase separation or uniform phase, we're not, we, we, we pretend we don't see individual particles. So, so this um, is not a gas phase. This is basically kind of- Right, um, this is not a gas phase, but it's a uniform yeah. phase without like a global density gradient, like what you can see in phase separated systems. That's right. what I mean here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, just a small question. Uh, you are tuning the James particle with electric field, right? Yes. So like, because the James particle is metal, so then you can use the electric field to, to tune the, the torque in other motion, right? Right, because the polarizability of the two hemispheres is very different. Okay, so then you can also use like magnetic field or other 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 field, right? Uh, if you have magnetic coating, sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think this is a wrap for today. Uh, we would like to thank Dr. Zhang Jie for his, for his wonderful talk and uh, inspiring discussion. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for offering this talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. And also thank for all the audience for participation. Uh, we, will see, we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.